blacks in technology. Black, 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 blacks in technology. Blacks in technology. Black, blacks in technology. Blacks in technology. Black, blacks in technology. Welcome everybody to the 45th episode of the Blacks in Technology Audio Podcast. I'm your host, Greg Greenlee, along with my co-host, Ayuri Selassie. Um... Today we got a very another great uh, podcast. We have uh, guest Joshua H- Hoskins uh, on uh, on the podcast here with us today. But before we get into uh, him and his background, we're going to do, go over a little uh, housekeeping, some of the stats uh, from the previous c- couple of weeks since our last podcast. Actually, we had a podcast. We've been doing podcasts pretty pretty frequently here. We've done like two or three of them just in the past couple of weeks. Um, So, member count, we're up to uh, 1,057 members on the Blacks and Technology site. Uh, Check us out at www.blacksandtechnology.net. On the Twitters, uh, we're up to almost 3,000 followers, so continue to support Blacks and Technology. If you want to follow us there, it's at Black and Technology. That's B-L-K-I-N-T-E-C-H-N-O-L-O-G-Y. LinkedIn member count, uh, we do have a LinkedIn group. We're almost up to 1,300 members there. So uh, if you want to check us out on LinkedIn, we also have groups there, uh, discussions going on. And also a Facebook um, uh, community as well. So facebook.com forward slash Blacks and Technology. Uh, and also, if you are listening to the podcast and you want to, you know, give us, tweet us some show ideas or some topics that you'd like to hear, uh, Use the hashtag on Twitter, Bit Tech Talk. That's B I T T E C H T A L K. That's Bit Tech Talk. So I'm going to hand this over to Ayori. Ayori is going to introduce our guest, and we're going to get underway here. Hey, Ayori. Hey, everybody. Hey, Greg. Good to be here again. Um, we have uh, in the room with us Joshua Huskins. Uh, Huskins. Um, and uh, Joshua is a a consultant in the cloud space. So we're really excited to have him here today. He's uh, with Aperio, and um, he's got some pretty awesome stats and badges associated with his name. And um, so I'm going to pass it on over to Joshua and, and let him talk uh, about himself. Hey, are you right? real quick? <laughs> Uh, sorry, Joshua. I just want to say, uh, tell us what's what's leading up to this because we there's there's something going on at Salesforce. Give us a little bit of background, real quick, Ayori, behind what's going on at Salesforce and the reason why. Uh, one of the reasons why we brought Joshua on on today's show. Yeah. So uh, uh, we've got this huge conference that's happening this week um, with some really amazing heavy hitters. Uh, in the in the cloud computing space, in the enterprise cloud computing space, uh, and it's called Dreamforce. So, uh, folks in the Bay Area, uh, you know, go out uh, Dreamforce.com, uh, register for one of the free passes, and check out our keynotes. There's going to be um, uh, Cheryl Sandberg's doing a keynote, uh, Maria Marissa Mayer, Deepak Chopra, and all these uh, other really incredible folks in tech and in inspiration and in motivation. And um, since Joshua works in that space, it really just made sense to absolutely have him uh, on during this time. So, yeah. yeah. Awesome, guys. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Um, so th- thanks for the introduction. Uh, like, like I already said, my name is Joshua Hoskins. I am a solution architect for Aperio. I've uh, been with that organization for about three years. Um, my cloud experience and, and sort of my career is taking – me down the path from, you know, starting from a help desk uh, representative to being an IT director and now being, you know, a solution architect. And so uh, happy to share that path with with you guys today and then the audience that's that's listening. It's it's been a cool ride. And uh, I like like to uh, share that with other people whenever I can. Awesome. Yeah, it's really amazing. You you mentioned um, you were an IT director at the age of 22, uh, which is pretty incredible in itself. Uh, so, t- give us tell us a little bit about that experience. How did you how did you even get the job and uh, uh, w- become an IT director at 22 years old? Some people are just uh, just starting off in, in IT period, and here you are, you are an IT director at 22 years old. So, tell us about that. Yeah, sure. So, when I graduated high school, I had the opportunity to uh, to basically work for a um, a timeshare company in the IT department. 
And uh, I had this great boss, uh, Tramel Ali, who uh, I'll thank uh, uh, you know forever for for giving me the opportunity. Um, but before that, I was a developer. I sort of started my developing career kind of early, and at that point in time, I was doing a small website, a small database, and uh, there was a lot of hours, and uh, really wasn't driving with my school schedule. So um, you know, I focused on school, and then after I graduated. I jumped to this help desk uh, job, and uh, the only thing I remember talking about, Shamel, is I just want to be able to go to a job and put in my eight hours and then, and then go home. And that's pretty much what the help desk job is. You go, you pick up the phone, you serve customers, and then you, uh, you leave for the day. So it still allows you to you know, work hard and play hard, which is really the two things that I love to do <laughs> in my life now. Um, but, you know, and so after that, after three years of working for the help desk, the interesting thing is you get to learn a little bit about all the technologies. Web sphere, uh, servers, you know, management, communication plans. When things go wrong, what do you do? And so, um, you know, that after three years got a little repetitive because I wasn't being challenged. And uh, after that, my good friend over at Orlando Jobs, Scott Katroba and Roger Lear, um, they were looking for an IT director in the technology that I had um, coded prior to working as a help desk person. So I wanted to get back into coding, and uh, it was just a small company. They do job boards out of the Orlando area, and it was a perfect match. I needed to be challenged again, and so I went into that space, and I was you know, there for another three years as well. That's great. I really like how uh, you, know, you sort of segued from this position in a help desk um, and just learning all the different technologies there and then kind of just jumping like bam into – into a, a director level position because I think sometimes folks don't always realize the power uh, that they have um, in the positions that they're in. It just really depends on how you leverage that experience um, and how you perceive yourself. And going to a small company and being a director is 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 something that um, I think sometimes people don't, don't think about how what that opportunity means and what it what doors it'll open up for you in the future. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is always looking for the next thing. Um, throughout my career, uh, I've always had this uh, this sort of niche in, in the back of my mind where what do I want to do next, right? Um, I, I am very much uh, against where I don't subscribe to being complacent, uh, going to work and not being happy. Uh, you know, if I'm ever not happy, I want to understand why I'm not happy and what I can do to change that. Because at the end of the day, you're the one that's controlled uh, in, in your own destiny. And uh, the only way that I was going to be happy and, and, you know, be challenged and move on is to be able to, to challenge myself and look for opportunities. So um, to the folks listening, you know, always believe in yourself and always be looking for the next thing. It might not be uh, what you want to do at that moment in time, but you can always uh, create a plan and a pathway to that, to that next thing. Yeah, that's excellent advice. I, that um, actually um, kind of parallels some, something that I'm actually going through right now. And I always looked at it in that manner as well. You know, I started out um, uh, on the help desk, but I knew that it was a stepping stone for me. And I always had um, in mind what I wanted to do next, where I wanted to go, and, and the steps that I needed to take in order uh, in order to get there. And I think that's very, very valuable advice. Yeah, because you have so many learning opportunities as well. I mean, you know, because I was I was always wanting to do more than just answer the phone call, I sort of ended up being assistant administrator, too, for all the guys who were at the bar and a server went down. You know, they'd call me up, hey, Josh, log in and, and, you know, restart this service and everything will be good, and, you know, we'll talk about it in the morning. You mean you didn't tell them that wasn't your job? <laughs> no, I wanted, I wanted to do something cool. I wanted to do something different. I wanted to do stuff that, you know, people didn't know how to do. And uh, I think that's what really um, made me very, uh, very um, easy to work with in that environment. So I was a trusted uh, partner to a lot of the developers and a lot of the system administrators because they knew that they could rely on me to go above and beyond what my job was. Yes, make yourself valuable. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Now tell me. Yep, go ahead. No, go ahead. Finish what you were saying. I was just going to say, uh, you know, I'm this, I'm this big fan of, you know, you have to be able to innovate in your career. You have got to be something, you got to be able to do something different um, and, and stand out. And uh, the minute that you stop standing out, the minute that you don't innovate, it's very easy to, uh, to go away. Uh, you know, case in point, Blockbuster. 
you don't innovate, you <laughs> die, basically, right? <laughs> and so always, always keep, you know, true to yourself and always keep it fresh. And, you know, everyone may, may not always agree with, uh, you know, with the, the new styles or nuances of how I do things. But uh, ultimately, it gets stuff done in, 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 it's, in an innovative way, which is um, a lot different from, you know, big old corporate America button-up style. So, um, you know, I, I sort of um, really rely on my attitude and my persona uh, to life and my career to, you know, really drive, you know, how people interact with me, and that's always fun. That's awesome. I, I want to ask about um, how you got into the cloud space because um, I've, I've sort of been really involved in that space from from really from very beginning before the word cloud was even used. And I remember there was always a lot of pushback from folks who, uh, you know, a lot of veterans in the space um, of technology, like, oh, that cloud thing is new. It's going to go away. We don't like this. But, you know, you really embraced it and thrived in it. So I wonder, how did you get into it and tell us about that? Yeah, it's, you know, it's really interesting. So when I was at um, OrlandoJobs.com, um, uh, where I was coding in AFP, um, not even .NET those days, and, uh, you know, I was, you know, poking around, and then I, in the tech community in Orlando, they sort of exposed me to Ruby on Rails. And I was that guy who was going to, you know, uh, you know, recreate, you know, recreate what we were doing today in ASP VD script on Rails, and it was going to be awesome because you can read the language when you code and things like that, and it was just awesome. So I was, you know, heads down trying to make that happen, and uh, it's interesting because, you know, we had a small, you know, Salesforce, you know, uh, license as well. So we used Salesforce for the sales cycle, but it wasn't tied into the back end, so these two systems didn't talk to each other. And so I love integration, so I want to basically um, integrate the two and, you know, build more on Salesforce. And, um, you know, I went to a user group meeting in Orlando for Salesforce because I wanted to learn a little bit more about it because, you know, I thought it was just, you know, you know, Salesforce. We pay a lot of money for it, you know, on a yearly basis, right? But why pay all that money when you can rewrite it in Ruby and Rails? You know, so I, too, didn't understand the value in cloud and how you could extend, you know, platforms like Salesforce to actually meet your business needs. Uh, so I was in the mindset that we we're going to be building Rails and we're going to get rid of Salesforce, <laughs> actually. And, uh, you know, I went to my first user group session. And I started playing around with custom objects and workflows and business processes. And back then, we were on professional edition. And, uh, you know, it, it was a really cool thing. So I got back and I got a phone call immediately. They were like, hey, do you want to play around with the development? And, you know, from the developer forms, I started creating uh, custom code, custom triggers. And so I sort of uh, hopped into that cloud space just by nature of getting involved in the community. Right. right, going to user group meetings wow. and things like that. And that's what really jump-started my career is, um, is being able to be a part of those conversations and have a conversation about business process. And, uh, and you know, ever since that, I've been a form, you know, Salesforce.com believer uh, in the cloud, user-centric processes and things like that. So definitely subscribe to the Kool-Aid. Uh, <laughs> a little bit too much at times. Champagne, champagne. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's uh, it's 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 been a great ride, and you know, I, you know, I, that's very much what a period is about. It's about cloud technologies, making sure that you know people can you know accelerate their business and reimagine their business uh, in the cloud without you know the the expensive overhead of you know administrators and you know servers and you know the total cost of ownership in the cloud is a lot less than having an on-premise system. So, uh, that, you know, all that stuff I subscribe to, and I think it's it's great, and it's really where the world is going. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, and I uh, I check, and you know, I I work in the um, uh, in the cloud space as well. Uh, I work for a company that provides uh, public clouds as well as we build uh, private clouds, and you know, there's still a lot of uh, people out there that don't believe in the cloud, and and you know, don't. Um, take advantage of what the cloud can offer and, you know, are still, some people are still skeptic. So um, I think what you just described is, is, uh, is, is, is very good. Um, I took a look at your website and it has this cloud logo with the letters MVP on it. Tell us, tell us about that. Is that an award or what's that all about? Yeah, it's a Salesforce de uh, designation um, to trusted individuals in the community. Um, so, like I said, I sort of jumpstarted my Salesforce career in the community itself, which is our user group community. So, 
I went to the Orlando user group meeting. Um, I was a part of that first session. And then shortly after, I, I led uh, the Orlando user group. Um, most recently, I traveled to Singapore last year. I restarted that user group community. And uh, when I moved back to San Francisco last year this time, uh, I was a part of the developer user group in San Francisco. And so being a Salesforce.com uh, Salesforce MVP is just really a trusted partner in the ecosystem that engages the community. Um, it helps a lot with answering questions, fostering peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning, um, you know, getting uh, communications out about new features. And so my involvement in the Salesforce uh, community has um, been tremendous ever since uh, I, you know, drank the champagne <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, started, start, started down this, this road. And uh, I love doing that. I love getting in front of customers, talking about products and features and uh, solving problems. And so that's where the Salesforce.com uh, MVP, uh, you know, badge comes from, is being able to, uh, you know, take it upon myself to engage others, recruit others, uh, you know, and, and help others inside the ecosystem. Anyone from, you know, a one-person Salesforce administrator sitting at their desk to maybe, you know, 50 to 100 people that may come to our user group session. And just talking through their, process, their processes and problems and uh, giving some guidance. Well, congratulations on that because, uh, you know, there aren't a ton of, you know, MVPs out there, and that really – is a testament to you just stepping out there and being a leader um, in this community. And, and, I mean, we can see now how large it's grown. I mean, I have people contacting me all the time. How do I get my Salesforce certification uh, and things like that? So, you know, you just you started it on your own, and you really led that way. So congratulations. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. So um, on, on the topic of certifications, and, you know, sort of how do you get in? Can you tell us about some of the certifications you have and, you know, what was the experience like going out to get those? Yeah, so I'll, I'll start with my help desk days. So uh, I do have a help desk certification, and that has really influenced my career and, and been able to allow me to work with different organizations well. And, and uh, the, the one thing that I took away from having a help desk certification is being able to understand someone's problem. Um, and what it's going to take to resolve that, it had to set expectations. And the biggest thing that I, uh, th that I like about the help desk certification is how to check for success. How do you measure after you solve a problem that it's actually been solved to avoid the frustration and the user calling you back saying that, hey, listen, you know, this doesn't work again. You know, it's all about delighting your customers and being able to provide that value. So from the help desk certification, um, I then started getting Salesforce certification. So I'm a Salesforce administrator and also a Salesforce uh, developer as well, which just means that. I can be dangerous in solving people's <laughs> business problems, <laughs> you know? Uh, and, and so, you know, it's all about the customization. So having the know-how to talk through problems, vet uh, different scenarios and solutions for your customers, um, and just make sure that you're capitalizing on, on the system's native functionality before branching out into custom development. Mm. So, you know, just to follow up on that one, um, you know, there's that process when you've gone out, you've worked with a technology, you've studied to take a certification, and then, and then some people hit that wall and they're just afraid to jump and take the test and actually get the certs. Um, what advice do you have for people who are in that sort of space? Yeah, that's interesting. So my advice to people in that space would be to solve a problem. One thing that I don't do well is pick up a book and read instructions on how to do something and, uh, and uh, really learn from it, right? Because it's a sample. It's a demo. It's a hello world one, two, three. Uh, what works for me is being able to solve a real challenge. Mm -hmm. So whether it's volunteering with, with inside the community to, um, uh, to uh, make a process more efficient using technology. I've done that uh, in, in Orlando for a number of organizations. Is you know, hey, Josh, we really have this problem. How can you help us with this? And being able to quickly use Salesforce or a cloud technology or a cloud app, um, you know, at my fingertips to, you know, solve that problem. I think that's what people need to do is, you know, don't think about how, how do I read something and, and do something and then, you know, get to the end of it, but how do I solve something that's going to be very valuable to somebody? And, uh, you know, just from learning about, you know, how to get from, you know, start to finish on solving a problem, 
um, has has been very valuable for me, you know, versus you know reading a book. So you know, get out there, do you know, do something that's going to be valuable and that is also going to meet your needs on on growing. Mm-hmm. Great, great advice. Yeah, that's excellent advice. I think people get caught up in – a lot of people get caught up in just the process of obtaining a certification as opposed to, you know, using – taking that uh, that knowledge and, and applying it directly to, you know, things that they're doing at the moment or applying it to, you know, things that they want to do. Uh, and so that's I think that's great advice that you just gave. So prior to uh, to joining uh, Aperio, you started CRMified. Um, Tell us, tell us more about that experience. For one, explain to people who might not know what CRMs are. Explain that, and then tell us about your business, CRMified. Yeah, so uh, CRM stands for Customer Relationship Management, and uh, r- really, it can mean a lot of different things. But in the Salesforce community, um, what it really means is is having a technology that allows you to manage um, your relationship with the customer. And, you know, in today's world, there are a lot of organizations that want to see a 360-degree view of their customer, because that's important. I want to know what challenges you've had with my product. I want to understand um, if you're an advocate for me. I want to understand what you're saying about my company and my products. Uh, And I want to be able to know how to contact you and then what channels to contact you on. And so I, you know, build systems uh, for bigger organizations that help them do all of those things. And, um, you know, when, when I was uh, sort of reaching my, cha- you know, my, my point in corporate America where I wasn't challenged, I wanted to move on, I wanted to do the next best thing, and something didn't work out for me, I turned, you know, um, I turned, uh, you know, a situation that could have been, you know, rather challenging into lemonade by capitalizing on my passion to make people more efficient with their customers and streamline processes and, you know, being able to um, have, you know, uh, people um, be more satisfied with the systems that, that, that they work with because that they're making their job easier. And so I started CRMified um, just for a couple people asking me, hey, can you do this? It's a small one-month project. It's a two-month project. Um, or, hey, you know, we really don't understand how to do this. Can you help us? Because in corporate America, I was tired of commuting. I mean, my commute was only 20 minutes, but the fact that I had to get up every day, I had to get dressed, I had to drive to the office, I had to handle, you know, politics, <laughs> and then, uh, you know, and then be able to drive home and then do it all over again, uh, it was it was getting old, uh, frankly. And then you know, all these other people working in the cloud were like, hey, what are you doing? I work from home. I have flexibility. I can go wherever I want for lunch. I'll, I just went to Hawaii for two weeks and worked from there. So, you know, I was drooling, right? And so um, I started my own company, uh, you know, as aspiration for living up to what those people were doing because I found that quite interesting. Not having to be at a desk, um, you know, it was, was intriguing to me um, because I wanted that flexibility that other people in the cloud were having as well. And, uh, you know, out of that, I wasn't in business for very, very long um, because I went to uh, Dream Wars, uh, which is the conference that, that you guys spoke about earlier that's coming up uh, this, this upcoming week. And uh, a friend of mine, Jeff Douglas, uh, recruited me after I was in a, a cloud spokes or a, a sort of a hackathon challenge, right? And, uh, and, you know, my life hasn't been the same since. And there's a couple of reasons why I chose to join Aperio after running my own business, you know, I, th- I feel like everyone's got to own their own business at some point in time, but you have to realize what you want to do next and if it's right for you. And one of the things about CRMified is it was the Josh show, right? It was me, myself, and I doing invoicing, doing customer relations, uh, doing, you know, accounts receivable. And, uh, you know, you have to really look at that hard and say, do you want to be able to manage all aspects of your business, or do you want to do the things that you're fun at? And the difference between CRMify, which was great for a while, and Apurio, which, you know, is just amazing. I, I, I can't believe how awesome the company is I work for. Um, but the difference is, is being able to travel. You know, since I joined Apurio, I've been to, I've lived in Singapore, I lived in San Francisco, and now I'm actually based out of London. And, right. you know, the, the thing that was different for me, uh, for me at Aperio is I get to do things that I'm passionate about, right? 
I get to solve problems. I get to work with a really, really, really good group of people. And I get to, um, I get to focus on that, you know, and not worry about the business, not worry about the invoicing, right? Um, and, and that's really special to me. And to, to have a company that is so uh, innovative and doing things differently in, in the cloud space um, and doing things that haven't been done before, and you know, really trying to mature these products and our, and our offerings is something that excited me. And you know, when you're in a when you're in a, a cloud consulting world, um, you really have have to embrace it and move forward. And for me, um, that's you know, that's you know, CRMify my own business, and then jumping to a professional services company like Aperio, and it really, you know, it allowed me to focus on what I really enjoy doing is being in front of the customer, talking about processes, talking about how, how do we move the needle? You know, we're, we're here. How do we get to be? How do we get to see? And, and ultimately, what's our roadmap going to look like in a year for being able to manage our customers and grow our customer relationships? And being at the front, at the front of those conversations is, uh, is what I look forward to every day when I deal uh, with customers. I love that. I love that going from this conversation of working at a help desk, of doing development work, being like in London with one of the big five consulting agencies in the world. So that's awesome. Um, and on the on the grain of consulting, I want to ask about sort of uh, the process of, of asking questions because I think asking the right question is so important um, and being successful in this field. And I really want to like what advice do you have on that? How do you do that? I mean, clearly you do it very well. So talk about that. Yeah, so one is always keep learning. Uh, it's, you're never done uh, learning on how to engage with people. Just, to think, just when you think you have all the personalities nailed, there's one that creeps up on you. Um, so I'm still learning how to refine that, and that, that was one of the things, uh, reasons why I joined Aperio as well, is having my own consulting firm, not really having experience you know, professionally consulting uh, with you know, other organizations. My, my vernacular with customers was – a little rough around the edges, let's say. <laughs> I couldn't say no without saying no. I said no, and then I stopped. But what, I, what professional consulting is, has taught me is it's taught me to say no and then be able to defend no and say why no is, in, is important and is going to deliver value to them. So it's really saying no without saying no, you know, giving, giving them a bone to sort of continue the conversation. Yeah. So. I'm still learning in, in that aspect, but there are a couple things that I'll say here is um, ask open-ended questions, right? So at the end of my meeting, I'm always asking, what other questions do you have for me? Instead of, do you have any other questions for me? Because that open-ended question is, uh, is, is um, received far greater than this two-step process. If I ask, do you have any questions for me, I first have to decide if I have any questions for you. And then the second decision I have to make is, what is that question? And so to speed things up, uh, you know, it's always, you know, what other questions do you have for me? And it's just, a, you know, an open mindset and just talking to people. So uh, we were talking about this earlier. Even if you have to correct someone in terms of your, your speaking or maybe they don't have um, the details correct, you start that sentence off with yes. And then you, you proceed to uh, paint the picture of, of actuality and, and, the, and the real deal. And I think that in my consulting experience, um, that's also what helps me is to be a very as-of-a-matter-of-fact person, right? I don't build emotions into it. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's very simple to me. And sometimes it's too simple. It's black and white, and there's, you know, very little gray. But if you want something, it's going to require input, and it's require output, whether that's um, effort, whether that's investment, um, there's got to be a clear way to get through, you know, from A to Z without the emotions involved. And I feel like in the professional consulting world, it's a challenge because you have these people who live and breathe their career and, you know, really want their job to uh, excel. And uh, sometimes you're at the mercy of technology. And so it's hard for the business partners I work with not to feel that, you know, that $2 million or a million dollar project is tangible for them. Mm -hmm. And they start to have all these, you know, preconceived notions of what I should be getting from you. And really it's taking, dialing that back down and saying, wait a minute, this is a partnership. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's some type of financial investment, 
but there's give and take on both sides. Mm -hmm. And how do we partner together to be successful? And how do we make this an iterative, you know, relationship rather than a transactional relationship? Mm -hmm. And so there are a lot of different pieces that I've learned uh, after stepping into the professional consulting world that, you know, have grown my career and um, make me – a, uh, a consultant that really truly focuses on delivering value. Mm. And just as simple as asking questions the right way, I call those little, you know, mind games like life hacking. This, you know, that is the core of dealing with different scenarios and different people. And, you know, when I leave an organization, I move on to a different project. I think that's one thing that people value is, is being able to be clear be concise and drive to value as opposed to, you know, let me get your ideas, let me go away for six months, and then let me deliver something to you Mm. that you're not going to like. And, and, you know, part of my job is to make sure that I balance all of those different expectations from, you know, the sales cycle to the delivery cycle and making sure that we deliver on our promise, which is really taking organizations to the next level with cloud technologies. Yeah, no, that's great. I I, I really like how – you know, you sort of brought in that aspect of trust and that aspect of collaboration um, and partnership because, you know, when you're working on a project and you have a problem to solve, you may be solving it on your own, but, but people still want to feel like they're part of that process. And that's a skill of relationship management to, to make sure that um, people feel included and that they're really going to be satisfied with the end result. Yeah, they have to be along for the ride. And if you drag someone uh, along for that ride, uh, they will be your worst enemy. <laughs> <laughs> and it won't be good at the end. Um, so, you know, having people a part of that process, when I'm, when I'm building solutions and, you know, architecting, uh, I call them sexy things that do cool stuff, <laughs> um, you, you've got to be able to um, realize and, you know, look around, look around you, you know, just not, don't drive, as we say, but, you know, look, look around and, you know, um, be uh, intuitive about the conversation in the room and feelings that are happening. You know, uh, I, a lot of my job, too, and I'm still learning to do this well, is reading between the lines. Mm. Because someone mm-hmm. says ABC. They they probably mean D E F or it may be a backhanded uh, uh, compliment <laughs> per se, right? <laughs> and so uh, being able to understand those idiosyncrasies of you know what goes on in a conversation and how to react, and in a lot of cases how to not react and you know make it more of a professional conversation and removing that emotion. So uh, you know still got a lot to learn in that area, but uh, three years ago. I definitely was not in this spot for mm-hmm. sure, mm-hmm. and I, I'm still I'm still learning and learning by reading. You mm-hmm. know, uh, having conversations in Singapore is very different from having conversations in the UK, mm-hmm. uh, which is very different from having conversations in the states. And uh, I, I think I'm very humbled to have had the opportunity to move into these other countries and to be able to work with um, individuals and uh, organizations in all of those countries uh, to deliver value. Man, I'm soaking up game over here, y'all. <laughs> this is fun. <laughs> That's great, great. Yeah, yeah so am I. Um, I kind of want to shift in a little bit from uh, talking about some of the, the the soft skills to talking about some of the, the hard skills, uh, such as uh, you mentioned uh, on your site that you like designing data models. Uh, so tell us a little bit about a little bit about what's involved with building data models and why why is it important for Salesforce? That's great. So your data model is essentially your foundation. It's 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 really I, I guess one of the the biggest foundation piece uh, pieces at the technical level um, because you need to be able to make sure that you store data in a scalable way. You know, a, a lot of what uh, companies, you know, that uh, don't have the data model at the forefront of their mind, they end up making more work for themselves. Um, and uh, by not building a data model that will be able to scale your business. And, you know, that, that is uh, something that's very important when um, implementing a, a system to be able to um, allow an organization to grow not only next year, but the next three to 10 years, 
right, without having to go back to the drawing board every two years and recreate what you built. So it's all about extending um, the, 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 the data model and building on, onto it because you start with a foundation and then you, you grow on it. And uh, I don't know how technical I want to get on, on this call, but... Um, get as technical instance, as you need to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, get as technical uh, as you need to, man. <laughs> then I have to I have to figure out how to put it in words. Um, uh, <laughs> we got a we got a whiteboard in here, so but you guys can't see that. <laughs> yeah. um, so I mean, it, it could be as 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 simple as um, as as this. Um, if I am uh, if I am a contact at a company, and I am coming to your conference this year, right? And I mm-hmm. can attend one or many sessions. Not five sessions, not two sessions, but many sessions. I would build a data model like this. I would have an object for my contact, and then I would have a custom object for the sessions that I'm allowed to join. And then I need another object to sort of join the two together that says this contact is, uh, you know, attending this session. So that's three objects in my data model. Another way to build that, which would not be the right way is just to have your contact, Joshua Hoskins, and check boxes to mm. say that, you know, I'm attending 2000, you know, this session in 2013. But really, if you had to do that, the administrative overhead to maintain those check boxes on that one object is going to be labor intensive and it's not going to be able to scale. So, uh, you know, you could do it with two objects, but the right way to do it is three objects. The sessions that people can attend the contacts, which are the attendees, and then a junction object that joins them. And that allows you to, you know, it, it doesn't restrict you to have five sessions one year or 20 sessions one year or 100, 100 sessions the next year. It allows you to scale. As long as you keep on populating those sessions, as long as you keep on having attendant, you know, attendees register, that junction object will, will scale to really N. It's the nth degree, right? So I can be a part of zero sessions, maybe I just register and don't attend any of them, which means I have no records in that junction object, or I can attend a thousand sessions over my time. And really, um, you know, that data model, if, we, if you take a look at it, the optimal way of creating that with three objects also allows you to report on it more effectively, mm-hmm. right? So then I can go to that junction object that says, this person attended these sessions in the year of 2013, and then how many sessions did they, did they attend in 2014, and really be able to a- analyze that data that you collect because you built your data model appropriately. If I built it, um, you know, it, uh, inadequately, I end up shooting myself in the foot because I will have to rethink that to get reporting mm, you know, yeah. out in a couple of years. Yeah, and that's, that's so real because, uh, I mean, I've seen it. So many times where somebody would just um, start out with what they think is a really simple solution to something and then find out, you know, at the end of the year when their executive wants a certain kind of report that they cannot provide it. And then they end up bringing that data into Excel or something like that. Um, And just to sort of um, build a bit of a bridge to those folks who are not familiar with the, the, the Salesforce product is, you know, an object is really the same thing as a table in a database. Um, and, so, uh, and so that really just transfers over to anything. That same concept transfers over to if you're building a system, uh, a Ruby on Rails system, and you're using a MySQL database or something of that nature. Um, uh, and I think the great thing about this particular product and, and these cloud solutions is that there's so many different things that are already built in, like reporting, um, and, you know, different things like the contact is already in place and there are little pieces that kind of feed off of that. So you don't have to, you don't have to build everything from scratch. You just get to extend on it. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and to be honest with you, that's a, that's a big mantra that we have at Aperio. Um, for all of our engagements, we build assets. And those assets go into our asset library. Mm. And one of the big things is never being able to, you know, start from scratch and not and having that foundation and um, having those tools in, in place with um, with um, with a great company 
allows you to really focus more on the solution and the architecture and the foundation. So you don't have to always go back to the drawing board and, you know, recreate something. Uh, you know, I, I think a, a lot of that, I'm going to go back to soft skills for a, a, a second, is to be able to identify what the next question is going to be and, and how, to, uh, how to determine not only what an organization needs now, but what an organization is going to need at the end of the project or in five years or where they can be. Even if, even if they don't know it, you have to be able to be that visionary to walk them through that roadmap and set them up for success even if you're not engaged with them, you know, uh, you know, in the years to come. At least, you know, the pride that I take out of having an engagement is being able to, you know, really leave them with a, a sustainable system that's going to be scalable, that they can extend, and that they don't have to recreate, you know, in two years' time. Yeah, and I think, I think really everybody should do that. Um, if you're an independent developer, you need to be building an asset. Um, you know, if you are... Uh, individual contributor at a company, everything that you work on that's intellectual property, like, you just file it away. <laughs> Be able to pull it out at, at a moment's notice. Yeah, it's all, it's all about having the experience, you know. You know, one, one thing that uh, I, I consistently, um, I wouldn't say a challenge, but one thing that I consistently experience is uh, the fact that I did something and I, and I followed it through, through A to Z. Uh, is very important to me because now my job is to really interact with our account executives and uh, be on the uh, uh, sales side of engagements before they go to delivery. And I find when I walk into a sales meeting and I, and I prep a, a presentation, every presentation is never the same because it's a different problem. It may be a little bit of the same question, but being that I have that experience and I, and I, and I know what to look for, I know the pitfalls, um, those allow me to um, talk with confidence about it. So it's all about driving that next thing. You know, it might not look sexy to you today, but it's definitely going to be an asset for you to grow on in terms of a foundation, um, you know, in, in your next project that you have. Mm-hmm. Yeah, awesome. So, man, we just went through a lot. <laughs> <laughs> that is a lot of information. I know that the listeners um, uh, for this podcast um, are taking notes and are thinking about how they're going to apply, you know, these life hacks and these tips and tricks um, to their experiences. So um, uh, definitely want to hear back from folks. You know, how did you how did you you know take this information? Um, tweet us um, at hashtag. Fit Tech Talk, and let us know um, how you felt about this. And um, just, I guess before we close, I want to ask you, Joshua, what's next? <laughs> uh, that's, that's a great question. Um, you know what? Uh, most recently, I uh, transitioned to London, so I've been there for about a month. And, uh, you know, I, I had to ask myself that last month because I, I was meeting <laughs> one of those goals where, you know, I, when I came back from Singapore, I'm like, I want to do an international assignment again, right? And so, um, you know, it, it's hard to say right now because I'm just coming, um, I'm just, you know, uh, beginning on a new transition in my life. So uh, I, I'm still feeling very challenged, uh, but I'm certainly looking for what that is. Uh, mo- most recently, what it's been is, is getting myself in, in a routine, um, at, you know, in my new digs in, in London, because that's important. And so, um, when, when, I, when I moved from San Francisco to London, I made a couple of promises to myself, and one of them was that I was going to continue to stay fit uh, by running um, and by getting me, myself, and I in order um, to, so that I can fulfill <laughs> more goals that are not career-oriented. I feel like I've, I've doubled down on my career for quite some time. And uh, now, it's, now it's time to double down on my personal life. Mm. And, uh, you know, that's what's next for me. And uh, what's interesting uh, for even me to listen to about that is it's not career-focused, right? You know, I talk a lot about my career on, on this call. But, um, it's, you know, you only live one life that we know about, mm. right? And you've got to take care of yourself and you've got to live your life uh, to the fullest. Mm-hmm. And you have to be satisfied with that. And no one else, no one can, uh, uh, can, can change that but you. And so I'm making the switch in life to get into a routine where 
uh, I'm, 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 you know, striving harder to define that work-life balance. Uh, and start to uh, have some personal goals set for myself mm-hmm. uh, that I that I expect to accomplish in the, in the next couple of, uh, next couple of years, months, or whatever it be. But it's been a big step for me not to have it uh, career driven, and uh, that that's what I'm looking forward to in the next years. Wonderful, great, excellent. Um, um, and we're going to be checking back with you, Joshua, and and hopefully we'll have you back on so you can. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Talk to us more about that. Yeah, this, this is this has been fun. Um, you know, uh, for the for you guys listening, uh, you know, I'm out there on the social community. You can follow me at uh, on Twitter at at J Hoskins. That's J H O S K I N S. And uh, occasionally, I uh, write a blog post at uh, CRMified.com. So uh, you know, <laughs> I need to get back into blog posting, but you can usually. Uh, <laughs> usually catch some throwback Thursday pictures that I've been tagged on <laughs> on my blog. But, uh, I'll, uh, you know, that, that should also be a goal for me as well. I've sort of been slacking on that. But uh, feel free to reach out if you have any questions. And, you know, happy to join you guys again for another session. Great. All right, Joshua, I want to uh, thank you uh, uh, for definitely taking time out of your day and joining us on this podcast. I also want to extend uh, an invitation to you if you would uh, like to join the, the Blacks and Technology community site uh, at blacksandtechnology.net. Uh, we're always, um, you know, open to uh, people joining and, and, and engaging in the community. We have a lot of software developers on the site as well. It's free to join. Uh, so if you, um, if you feel up to uh, joining that and engaging in the community, you're more than welcome. Uh, and once again, thanks for, uh, for taking time out your day. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, I, I think community is probably my uh, – built into my name someplace. It's maybe my third or fourth name. So <laughs> ha- happy to participate in all the communities that I can. Excellent, excellent. Great. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Bye. All right. Blacks in technology. Black, 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 blacks in technology. Blacks in technology. Black, blacks in technology. Blacks in technology. Black, blacks in technology.